Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jessica Boynton? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. In April 2016, Jessica and Matthew Boynton were a married couple who lived in an apartment in Griffin, Georgia. This is about an hour south of Atlanta in Spalding County. Jessica was 19 years old and a stay-at-home mom. Matthew was 21 years old and just took a job as a police officer. The couple was raising two sons. One was two years old and the other eight months old. The marriage between Jessica and Matthew was not in good shape. They were interested in getting divorced. Both of them had been unfaithful during the course of their relationship. In December of 2014, prior to being married, Jessica became pregnant with her second son as a result of an affair. Her lover was a mechanic who she met when she was searching for a wedding venue to marry Matthew. I'm not sure what type of wedding venue would employ a mechanic. Was Jessica looking to get married at a Jiffy Lube? Either way, this is probably not the best sign for the health of the future marriage to Matthew. Jessica and Matthew decided to get married anyway. Matthew intended to raise Jessica's second son as his own. In the spring of 2016, Jessica discovered that Matthew had a girlfriend who was a police dispatcher. This girlfriend worked for Matthew's grandfather, who was the sheriff of Spalding County. Both Jessica and Matthew were trying to build a case against each other for the upcoming and inevitable custody dispute. Jessica kept a journal where she recorded everything that Matthew did. Matthew started calling the police and saying that Jessica was physically harming him. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On April 14, 2016, at around 9 p.m., Matthew called a lieutenant who was working in the police department and said that Jessica was poking him in the chest with her finger. After this, the family took a trip to a Walmart. Jessica and Matthew had an argument in the baby food aisle. At about 10.45 p.m., Jessica walked out of the store and did not want to leave with Matthew, but eventually she did. The family arrived home just after 11 p.m. After midnight, now on April 15, Matthew left the apartment to go to a Waffle House with a fellow police officer. At 12.54 a.m., Matthew received a text message from Jessica's phone. The message implied that Jessica was going to bring an end to her own life. She was suffering for a while and no one noticed. The message instructed Matthew to take care of the children. It ended with the words, I love you and the boys. Matthew called a friend of his who worked as a dispatcher. He asked for the police to go to his apartment and check on his wife. He was on his way there as well. Matthew arrived at his apartment before anyone else. He claimed that he heard two shots fired. This was at around 1 a.m. Matthew had entered his apartment, retrieved his police radio from the kitchen, and used it to report those two gunshots. At some point, he exited the apartment and waited outside. The police arrived and entered the house. They found the couple's two children unharmed. When they came to a closet door that was locked, they forced it open. They found Jessica on the floor with her head on a pillow. There was blood on the pillow, but no blood spatter on the walls. Jessica had been badly injured, but she was alive. She was airlifted to a trauma center in Atlanta. Underneath her body, the police found a 40 caliber Glock semi-automatic pistol. It was Matthew's service weapon. The police did not test for gunshot residue, but they did test her DNA. Jessica's DNA was on the pistol. There were two bullet holes in the walls of the closet, but they were on two different walls. The journal that Jessica had kept which detailed Matthew's alleged wrongdoings, was found in the closet as well. A few pages had been ripped out. When Jessica was examined by physicians at the hospital, they noticed there was no bullet hole in her head. It's not exactly clear what happened. Perhaps the bullet glanced off her skull. Either way, she had a severe head injury and was not conscious. When Jessica regained consciousness sometime later, she claimed that she did not remember what happened. She recalled being in the closet then waking up in the hospital. 
Jessica did not believe that she actually wrote the text message to Matthew at 12.54 a.m. on the day of the shooting, the message that indicated that she would be departing this world. Jessica indicated that her phone did not have a lock on it, and the word choices in the message were not consistent with what she would have wrote. For example, she would never have texted the words, I love you, to Matthew. Jessica believed that Matthew could have written the message. The authorities conducted an investigation of the incident. They did not do a good job. For example, they did not test Matthew's hands or clothing for gunshot residue. Investigators concluded that Jessica was the shooter. Matthew was cleared of any wrongdoing and allowed to return to his job as a police officer. Jessica eventually recovered enough to be released from the hospital, although she still suffered from pain due to her injury. In December of 2016, Jessica filed a police report saying that Matthew had not returned her belongings, specifically a gym bag that contained her retainer and her clothing. Matthew signed a statement saying he no longer had Jessica's property when, in fact, he did have the gym bag. Matthew was eventually charged with making false statements and violating his oath of office. Both of these charges are felonies. He was fired from the Griffin Police Department. In July 2018, the case was brought to a grand jury, but they failed to indict him, and that was the end of the case. Four months later, Matthew found a job as a reserve police officer in a small town. Jessica moved about two hours away and found a new love interest. Many people have called for the investigation into the shooting to be reopened, but there has been no movement in the case. Again, the authorities consider the case to be closed. Now moving to my analysis. This case is a bit of a mystery. It's not exactly clear what happened in that apartment closet on April 15, 2016. Was Jessica responsible, as the authorities suggested? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Jessica was the one responsible for discharging the pistol, starting with the factors supporting this theory. At the time of the shooting, Jessica and Matthew were going through a rough time. They were getting divorced. These two individuals appeared to be impulsive and emotional. When the police arrived at the couple's apartment, they found Jessica alone in the closet with a pistol that had been fired twice. Jessica's DNA was found on the pistol, although this would be expected considering the pistol was underneath her. At 12.54 a.m., a text message had been sent from Jessica's phone to Matthew's phone, which was consistent with the idea that Jessica was responsible for the shooting. The phone was found in the closet with Jessica. Matthew was not at the apartment when the message was sent. A minute after receiving the fateful text message from Jessica's phone, Matthew sent an unrelated text message to his girlfriend responding to something that she had written him. He wrote, quote, Ha ha, I'm sorry, I didn't think about that, lol, unquote. If Matthew was in the middle of staging some complex crime scene, why would he have taken the time to respond to his girlfriend? Matthew's service pistol was stored in the closet where Jessica was found. This makes it seem like she walked into the closet to retrieve the pistol. The closet door was locked, and the lock was on the inside. This is one of those locks that somebody could engage and then close the door, so anyone could have locked it. It was like an interior door lock, not the kind of lock used on exterior doors, which would require a key. Upon regaining consciousness in the hospital, Jessica said that she remembered being in the closet, but not what happened in the closet. It's understandable that after a brain injury, Jessica's memory may have been compromised. But if she could remember being in the closet, she should have remembered why she was in the closet. The decision to enter the closet, or whatever happened to get her in there, would have occurred prior to being in the closet. Now moving to the factors contradicting this theory. Matthew appeared to be controlling, stubborn, and immature. He was having an affair at the time of the shooting. Matthew was later fired from the police force, although he was never convicted of any crime. At the time he was fired, he admitted to lying about the gym bag. Matthew's grandfather was the sheriff of Spalding County. Perhaps this motivated investigators to find Jessica responsible. A few of Matthew's neighbors said that they heard gunshots at around 11 p.m. on April 14. This is two hours before Matthew reported hearing gunshots to the police. Nobody heard the gunshots at the time when Matthew said that he heard them. One neighbor claimed that after hearing the second gunshot, she noticed Matthew quickly walking to his vehicle. 
another neighbor heard banging not long before the gunshots, as if somebody was banging on a door. Matthew told the police that he did not change his clothes that night. However, when he was in Walmart, he was captured on video surveillance wearing a gray sweatshirt. Later, when he was captured on police body camera video, he was wearing a red hoodie. The angle of the shooting was unusual if Jessica was the one who discharged the weapon. The wound was on the top of her skull. Sometime after being released from the hospital, Jessica claimed that she had a new memory. After returning from Walmart, she had walked into the closet to get her shoes in order to walk the dog. In the police body camera video, the dog can be seen wearing a leash. The physicians at the hospital where Jessica was treated said that her hands were clean and she did not appear to be depressed. The journal Jessica kept had pages ripped out, although the pages could have been ripped out at any time. When considering the evidence, do I think that Jessica was responsible for the shooting? This case is challenging because the police did not conduct a proper investigation, and Matthew's grandfather was the sheriff of the county where the shooting happened. Despite the fact that some of the evidence in this case doesn't look too great for Matthew, I think that Jessica was probably responsible for the shooting. What happened in this case is far from obvious. In my opinion, I would say there was about a 55% chance that Jessica was responsible. So it's definitely not a landslide in favor of that theory. Matthew certainly looks suspicious and very well could be responsible. There are a few reasons I believe Jessica was the one who discharged the weapon. One, Matthew does not appear to be clever enough to have staged this shooting and manipulated investigators. In addition, I don't think he could have carried out his plan as he was texting his girlfriend. I find it hard to believe that multitasking would be one of Matthew's strong suits. This guy couldn't even successfully hide a gym bag. Two, if the neighbors really did hear gunshots, why didn't they call the police? Perhaps they heard other noises and then later came to think of those noises as gunshots. And three, Jessica's missing memories are simply too convenient. If Matthew was responsible, Jessica would have simply stated that in no uncertain terms. Again, she would have known how she ended up in the closet if she remembered being in the closet, which she claimed that she did. Her memory about intending to walk the dog came back after she left the hospital. Her story just isn't believable. I think a more logical explanation is that Jessica was upset with Matthew because he was texting another woman. Jessica knew about the affair, she was in the middle of a marriage that was falling apart, and it was a stressful time. A major part of the argument against Matthew is that he was impulsive and immature. That could be true, and Jessica could still be responsible at the same time. I think they were both probably impulsive and immature. Now moving to my final thoughts. The circumstances of this case are so unusual that despite being cleared of any wrongdoing, Many people believe that Matthew is guilty. The evidence in this case does not lead to an obvious conclusion, and I'd be surprised if any new evidence becomes available in the future. If Matthew was actually responsible for the shooting, then he was incredibly fortunate to have escaped responsibility. But I doubt he will ever escape the cloud of suspicion. Those are my thoughts on the case of Jessica Boynton. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.